Hey guys, Shane here with a quick post-production note. Uh, just wanted to let you know that uh, there are a couple points in this interview uh, where Smoker's audio isn't great. Um, it doesn't last long, and uh, especially, most notably, the first minute or two. Uh, it does clear up, um, but I will say, I just wanted to toss that in there so uh, you guys were aware. Uh, please bear with it, because uh, this is a really, really incredible interview uh, with Smoker. Thanks, guys. Are you sick of those damn political crusaders? The anti-libertarian libertarian party? Sick of the violence and coercion that makes up the status servile society with seemingly no escape? Are you looking for real practical solutions to increase your personal freedom and your invulnerability to coercion? If so, kick off your shoes, come inside the polyethylene A tent, and let's talk bonding. Join your host. Shane and Kyle as they further explore this freedom strategy and develop it into the modern day. You're listening to the Banu Podcast. And welcome to the Bonnie Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane. This podcast is covered by a fifth cops, no government license, so as reuse and modification to anyone except for government agents, governments, and the bloodies thereof. You can more by visiting fifthcot.org. So first off, please stick around to the end of the show for our Building the Agora segment, wherein we highlight great Agora's businesses, podcasts, uh, etc. that uh, could use your support. Uh, that said, I don't want to waste any time today, as I have been so excited for this interview. To be frank, I didn't think it would ever happen. So in this 10th episode of our Crypto Anarchism series, I'm joined by Smuggler from Anarplex.net and co-author of Second Realm Book on Strategy. If you're looking for someone living the Second Realm Crypto Anarchist life, look no further. Not that you'd be able to find him anyway. <laughs> this is the man that Cody Wilson said was actually doing shit when I met him last year. And uh, coming from Cody, that says a lot about uh, who I'll be speaking with today. So without further ado, Smuggler, welcome to the Vani Podcast, sir. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to be to pleasure to be speaking with you. Uh, how are you doing today? Well, thank you for having me on. Um, it's a great opportunity, I think, to to discuss the whole stuff with you. And I'm fine. How are you? Oh, I'm doing doing quite well. Thanks for asking. So uh, I guess uh, pretty pretty popular on uh, on Twitter on the Twitter world. People people really dig you there, and, and obviously uh, um, you uh, give give talks at Hackers Congress. You're very very uh, you know uh, respected and renowned in the crypto anarchist community. But for those in my audience that may not be familiar with you, uh, why don't you provide a brief introduction? Uh, who, who, who are you, and uh, what do you do? Um, there's no brief way of doing that. <laughs> so, um, what I am, uh, I'm Smuggler, I'm a human being, I'm interested in crypto anarchy and not just in the digital realm, but also in the physical realm. So how to do, to transport, um, crypto anarchistic, um, concepts from the digital to the physical. Um, and I work as a covert communications expert and, um, yeah, that's basically who I am. Fantastic. Covert communications expert. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, <laughs> so very good. And I will say one thing I really respect about you uh, is that you know, there are a lot of great crypto anarchists out there, um, but a lot of them are purely focused on the digital realm. And I guess for the past couple of years, I've been really focused on how to find freedom in the here and now and, you know, physical space and time. So when I came across Second Round Book on Strategy, I was like, yeah, this is this is what we need, you know. Uh, the digital digital realm is great, um, but you know, uh, we are social creatures, and uh, being in physical space and time around each other is seriously important. So um, that's uh, that's certainly certainly great to hear. Um, so I suppose, and I'm 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 really curious. Um, how, how did you get here? I mean, uh, I assume at one point you were a statist, uh, you lived a statist sheepish life, and something or a slew of something's happened. Um, I mean, how did you uh, get to where you are today? Kind of your story. Um, I'm not sure if I was an extra statist ever. I'm not sure. Um, I wasn't always a radical, but um, I always had issues with authorities that... Um, that weren't natural. Mm -hmm. So um, just by somebody saying I'm the boss, that doesn't fly with me. So <laughs> um, 
and I think I was always like that. And um, or as they say, I have issues with authority. So, um, and I come from a family that has been, um, how you say that, creative when it comes to the relationship with the state and the law and whatever. So, mm-hmm. uh, they weren't criminals, but they were, um, they knew when to bend the rules. And so I wasn't raised a complete sheep. Um, however, I tried for several years to fit in, uh, went to the military and stuff like that. And, um, over time I radicalized more, um, which also has a lot to do with, uh, my passion for computers and for the, um, less mainstream things you can do with computer communication. Mm -hmm. So, uh, at a very young age, I got into computer security and hacking and BBS systems. And, um, I kind of stuck with that and yeah, the, the combination of, you know, having authority issues and knowing how to deal with computers plus philosophical training, theology training, computer science, economics, um, kind of led to what I am today, whatever that is. Interesting. Interesting. So for someone who, uh, had problem, had, you know, such problems with authority growing up, I mean, uh, what made you join the military? Um, they had a very interesting job to offer, which I applied to, um, and signed a contract with them. And then I failed the security clearance and had to stick around a little bit longer until they released me. Uh, gotcha. Gotcha. Understood. So, um, <clears throat> very, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, so there's a question on Twitter that kind of goes right along, along with, uh, kind of your, your story and, and your life. Um, so Jay Daniel asks, uh, do you wear a mask every time you leave your home or what? How did you ease into your mask lifestyle? Um, I guess we'll start there. It's a multifaceted question. Okay. Um, I don't wear a mask all the time. Um, I wear a mask specifically at conferences and when I am somewhere in the persona of smuggler in the public. So, um, when there are people around making photos or if there are recordings or whatever, then I wear a mask. Um, outside of that, it really depends on stuff like mood and it depends on stuff like what I'm actually going to do. Um, so I do, it happens at least once a week that I actually wear a mask like in, in public where I live, but I don't leave uh, the house with a mask on. Uh, I put it on um, a little bit further away from the house. Um, and usually if I have to go places where I know that there's a lot of surveillance and I have to do things that I don't want uh, automated uh, face recognition to, to um, pinpoint me at. Um, in winter, I wear a mask much more, um, simply because it gets cold here and, um, because it's less suspicious to do that. Right. Right. Um, however, um, I have kind of started to wear a mask more simply because there, um, the number of mask wearing people is increasing, uh, because of agents coming to the city and stuff like that. So it's, um, it's a much less um, psychologically problematic thing to do because there's a certain psychological cost of doing that. And um, so it, it becomes more frequent. It has been far more frequent a few years ago than it got less frequent and now it's getting more frequent again. Um, but there's no, there's, there are functional reasons why I do it. It's not a fashion statement. Sure, sure. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned uh, um, you know the CCTV cameras, uh, the ones you know facial recognition cameras. Um, yeah, cer- certainly, exactly. uh, cer- certainly. Uh, uh, I, I definitely understand the reason. Now, I, I guess I was, I was, I, I, I appreciated this question because uh, here on the Pony Podcast, we've talked about. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Uh, you know, the gray man theory blending in, and uh, you know, I, I, I especially like uh, places I've I've lived. Um, I've like except in winter time, never seen people wear masks. So if someone's walking around with a mask on it'd be counterproductive, right? I mean, rather than trying to blend in and stay, and you know, stay incognito, um, you'd stick out like a sore thumb. 
Um, it, I'm not sure if that's true. Um, no. Because you you deal with multiple observers of multiple kinds. Um, you might stick out to a human, and the human might do something about that. You know, the human might say, hey, why are you wearing a mask? Um, but you might not be as easily identifiable for a computer. And so the, the real question is, whom do you hide for from? Not just the person, but also the instrument mm. of, of observation. Um, so, for example, when I'm in London, I mean, last time has been like two years ago, but uh, I've been in London a lot uh, before that, and I usually wore a mask all the time. And um, people didn't really care. And I actually went to the police and, and got, you know, like a, um, a written statement that it's legal to, to wear a mask um, so that I wouldn't have like any problematic encounters with anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and there, because of the surveillance density, um, it made a lot of sense to always wear a mask. Um, in, in general, it really depends on what your environment is. And it also depends a little bit what you think your threat model is and it also has to do with believe in the gray man or not um, because the there's one thing that is sticking out like a thor's thumb but the other thing is can you get the fingerprint of that thor's thumb you know so um sometimes it's totally fine to stick out um and sometimes you, in reality, you cannot even um, suppress that completely. Um, but sometimes it, it just makes sense. It, it really depends on your on your uh, operational conditions. Um, what, who are you hiding from? Uh, what kind of interactions do you want to have or not want to have? Um, what do you want to communicate? Uh, and so on and so on. So the gray man is not always the right strategy to take. Um, and as I said, it really depends on your environment. You know, if you're living in a small city, you know, um, sticking out might be an issue. Um, if you're living in a metropolis that is multicultural and uh, where people look extremely different and where the mentality is a little bit more easygoing, mm -hmm. then um, no, you don't stick out with a mask, you know. Um, it's a lot of that stuff is in your head. It's not really in the head of others. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that was a very, very good explanation. Um, so I guess uh, I want to move on to, to talk a little bit about Anarplex now. Um, so sometime in your journey, uh, Anarplex.net happened. Uh, so could you tell us a bit about that? Uh, you know, why did it start? Why did, you, uh, why did it start? And uh, what sort of uh, what sort of things can people find there? Um, it started in 2007 or 8, if I remember correctly. Um, and the the reasons we we started it was uh twofold number one there was um a little bit of a business going on where we helped um people building darknets ip darknets to be exact um and we offered like a, a routing service between different darknets um that was the business side of anaplex um and still is to a marginal degree um, and the other reason was that I simply wanted a, a place where we can um, collect uh, writings of interest and maybe even, you know, projects and code of interest. And also Anaplex runs one of the oldest continuously operating IRC servers on the darknet. Um, and that IRC server was... Um, it was started because the invisible IRC project shut down and um, we thought that it would be a good idea to con continue the community. Um, of course, the community has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. It's not the same people anymore, but um, yeah, th those were the reasons. And um, one of the things we do, other than um, having the, the IRC um, server, is that we have a collection of interesting writings, at least in my opinion, um, that concern themselves with 
Crypto Anarchy um, with Second Realm, um, with Crypto Tribalism and stuff like that. So it's also one of the sites where I publish what I write. Um, I have a personal website, but Anaplex um, hosts most of my content as well. Um, and we also host content of other people. So uh, there are a few books that the authors allowed us to publish and stuff like that. Very good, very good. And, and yeah, I will say, I mean, I, I, I had a colleague tell me about Anarplex. He said, you should go check it out sometime. I think you'll really like it. And I kind of, I don't know, I, I didn't do it for, for a little while. But uh, I think it would have been like December 2017. I decided to visit it. And uh, I, yeah, I didn't leave that site for like two days. Just digging through everything on there. Um, it's so, awesome. so, so good. So I found Hashtag Agora, which is an incredible, I mean, uh, just incredible, uh, you know, fictional story. Then uh, um, It's not as much fictional as you believe. It's it's not as fictional as I believe. Yeah. Okay. I, I kind of had a feeling. <laughs> I kind of had yeah. a feeling. But uh, so so yeah, hashtag Gore was great. Read that in you know a couple few hours, uh, quick. You know, really good read. Uh, your book, second round book on strategy. Yours and X Y Z's book. Um, yeah. Incredible. Uh, another incredible story there, or not a story. Another book, an incredible book. And then. Uh, it was funny. So I, I was on Interplex and I found a lodging of wafering men. And uh, I, it was published anonymously, so I read. I started reading. It got like halfway through, and I was like, "Who the hell wrote this book? Like, who who wrote it?" And I just decided I decided to you know do a do a Google search and popped up on Amazon. Paul Rosenberg. And at this time, I'd been familiar with Paul because um, one of our colleagues, Ben Stone, um, uh, mentioned him um, in interviews. So I went, I went to Ben and I was like, "Dude, you got to connect. You got to connect me with Paul." And he did. He did. So I interviewed him once uh, over Skype, and then I went up to Chicago to interview him in person. Um, but it's like that was just a, an incredible, I guess, just a, a real life connection made from Interplex. So I figured you'd, you'd appreciate that. So, um, but yeah, just a, a lot of great stuff on there. I, I'd certainly recommend the listeners go over there, Interplex.net. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, but oh, yeah, just, just a, a terrific site just for the uh, just for the uh, books. But at the same time, the IRC chat's fun too. I don't get in there as much as I need, to, as much as I should. But I'll pop in from time to time and um, occasionally reach out to you. So <laughs> reach out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's um it's a it's a fun thing because sometimes I feel like um um like a historian in a way of um collecting writings that are a little bit out of left field. Uh, when it comes to to crypto anarchism, because there's like this this uh, American centered scene, then there's the more left oriented scene, and then there's the European scene of like political crypto anarchists, and um, that scene has it has existed for you know decades basically, but there has been this downtime where nobody cared about it. And um, there's a, a joke that it's totally a joke because it's not really true. But um, there's a joke between Paul and me often that we say, "Hey, there were there were times when we were the last two anarchists left on the planet," you know. So yeah, he's mentioned. Yeah, I've heard him say that too. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I, I asked him like, because uh, he, he's he's been doing this for a while as as, I'm, as, as you have yeah. too. And uh, I said, "Well, how has it changed in the past? You know, ten, fifteen, however many years it's been?" And he was like, "Oh my gosh." Like, there's a bunch of us now, and there were times I didn't think there were any. Um, he's like, where, 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 you know, where'd Bitcoin come from? But I probably know these people. I have to know these people, but no, yes. yeah, yes. different, I guess, possibly different yeah. folks. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely, definitely interesting. So, on the note of crypto anarchism, um, on preparation for this interview, I went and rewatched uh, your talk from Hackers Congress last year, and uh, mm -hmm. it was, uh, uh, I don't remember what it was titled, but something on crypto, something on crypto anarchism, oh, and um, the project of crypto anarchy. Yeah, 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 okay, that's it, that's it. So, and that I was, I was kind of surprised because um, obviously I didn't know a whole lot about you, and you're very, very into uh, you know etymology and words and you know grammar, kind of as per the trivium method, like really trying to understand what words mean. And uh, uh, I hadn't heard crypto, like I, I guess I just kind of clinged on to the more overarching, possibly I guess maybe you'd argue um, inaccurate. Um, you know, label of crypto anarchism on pretty much everything. So, I guess w would you kind of <laughs> give a, a brief a brief summary of, or I guess first off, I mean, how how would you define crypto anarchism? Um, crypto anarchism is implementing political anarchy by means of cryptography. 
and um, I would qualify that a little bit more. And that is um, what you really need to, to implement anarchy is to get into the concept of making rules, um, judging people and executing punishment. So that is like uh, where rulership really breaks down to, you know, if you, if you really look at rulership, it's somebody telling you what to do and then punishing you if you don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and everything else is just, you know, a uh, show, you know, but that's like the core thing about rulership. And um, so anarchy is about breaking this. And crypto anarchy breaks it by um, a very specific way. And that is that it undermines the ability of a ruler to attribute an action to a person. So, um, and that is the qualifier when it comes to the cryptography part of it. Um, in my opinion, the, the central tenant of crypto anarchy is cryptography that helps us to break attribution. So cryptography that allows us to stay anonymous, for example. That's the, the foundational thing about crypto anarchy is to break attribution. And um, that's it. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, yeah, so I, I definitely understood the attribution part, but is, is, does crypto anarchism have anything to do with the observation portion? Mm -hmm. uh, does crypto anarchism have anything to do with uh, the observation, like obscuring, I, I guess, uh, not allowing people to observe what uh, one individual is doing? Um, yes, possibly. I mean, you you have multiple ways of breaking attribution. Uh, one way of breaking attribution is that your actions are not actually observable. Um, so nobody can actually see the act, only the result of the act, uh, possibly. Um, the second thing is that um, it is impossible to describe the person um, making the act. Um, that would be anonymous, basically. Um, and then there's like um, a different way of anonymity. Um, and that is if you cannot uh, connect the person committing one act to a person committing another act. So it's a little bit technical there. But um, in, in general, you want to either break the observation or you want to break the ability to find the person again that did something. Um, yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. So, um, and I would definitely point, I'll put a link in the show notes to, uh, to smugglers, uh, talk last year at, uh, the hackers Congress and, uh, definitely recommend, uh, you go check it out. Um, I especially like the, uh, the Q and a section, even though I'm kind of a Bitcoin maximalist, I still enjoyed, I, I enjoy, <laughs> I enjoy your, uh, the, the way that you, you respond to, to questions. So when we'll, we'll get into that, uh, here later on in, in this discussion, but, um, I guess uh, also in terms of uh, that, dis uh, in terms of uh, that talk you gave, um, you, men you mentioned how your views have kind of changed over the past couple of years. Like uh, you used to be kind of anarcho capitalist, and uh, you aren't anymore. Could you kind of speak to how your views have evolved? Um, yeah. So one of the things that um, libertarians of the let's say us kind of looking at things often forget is that um, humans are social beings and that human interaction is not always monetary um, there are far more kinds of interactions that we have that are not um, visibly or not consciously value-based um, we ha we do a lot of things just to to raise our social standing, or because we want to be nice, or uh, because we have a uh, subconscious um, understanding that we have to cooperate with people, and the these nuances that actually make up most of our interactions and most of what um, makes social structures is a little bit lost in the in the anarcho-capitalist thought, um, because every social institution for anarcho-capitalists is um, a monetary market um, institution. It's like insurances, it's people that you pay mm -hmm. and so on and so on. Um, but the real mystery of, of the market is that the market is far bigger than monetary transactions. 
and it's often far more subconscious than uh, an, an, uh, an open price agreement. And so um, what we do a lot as, as humans is we just want to live together in a way that works out for us and others. And if one widens the whole perspective of um, proprietarian anarchism to also involve, um, involve uh, social institutions that are not priced, that are not paid, that are by implicit and not by explicit contract, then um, that is a much more humane and also a much more realistic way to look at, at um, the future of anarchism. So I'm not an anarcho capitalist because um, anarcho capitalists often ignore how many institutions are voluntary but not priced. Very interesting, yeah. And I mean, I, I've kind of started to, I guess, over the past year, I've, I used to call myself an ANCAP, and I don't really anymore. I kind of, if someone asks, I'm a free market anarchist. Um, and I guess there's two reasons for that. So obviously, some folks that claim that label um, have, uh, you know, advocated for some, some things that are contrary to anarchism, in my opinion. Um, and then mm -hmm. also, too, it just seems like um, anarcho-capitalists are so theoretical. Like, everything is, well, you know, in this hypothetical free society... This is how things could work. I said, like, "What about yes. now? What about now?" Yep. And there's not. Uh, yep. It seems like just you know, just just theorizing all day long. And uh, yep. you know, for the past three years, I've been focused on action. You know, what can we do in yes. the here and now to increase our freedom? And uh, yes. I got kind of, uh, I don't know. It's just kind of, uh, I don't know, frustrating. So I kind of uh, yeah, withdrew a little I totally from that agree. crowd. I totally agree. I mean, I would make it even worse, and that is. Um, I have often experienced um, anarcho-capitalism to be a justification for being a jerk um, and getting away with it. You know, so I can be an asshole as long as I'm rich, I will be able to live in society. And I don't think that a society of assholes works, no matter if there's a free market or not. And um, so in a way, I oppose the label because there have been too many jerks using that label for themselves. doesn't make every anarcho-capitalist a jerk, but there are too many jerks under the uh, label of anarcho-capitalism. Very true. Very true. So uh, what about agorism then? I mean, uh, obviously I can understand why anarcho-capitalism, um, but uh, what about agorism? Two ago at the Anarchist Conference, I actually gave a talk about uh, agorism or what I think about it. Well, I'm a big fan of dark markets, dark markets. I don't agree with algorithm, and the reason for that is because algorithm is a revolutionary strategy. And I think that, number one, revolutionary strategies are inherently fault, faulty, flawed. And the other is that I don't think that the systematic and uh, economic predictions of algorithm as a strategy to uh, dissolve the state uh, actually works. Um, the risk calculation in agorism is, in my opinion, naive. Um, on the other hand, um, I think that black markets um, are necessary and right. And if you're libertarian and you're not trading on the black market, then you're shut just full of shit. I mean, you're <laughs> just talking and not doing anything. So, um, yeah, I mean, be a black marketeer, but don't think that that alone will get rid of the state, if that is even the, the goal. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, that's that's kind of my stance on it, too. Um, no, actually, and this is a hidden part of libertarian history that I just recently I, I discovered about a year ago, but um, this podcast is called The Volume Podcast, and one of its main proponents uh, went by the pseudonym of Rayo. And uh, this he, he wrote an article called Ethical Enclaves, uh, Black Markets. This would have been when Conklin would have been like 18. And um, his kind of, it's, it's agorism, only without the, you know, start of the state and smash it. It's just, hey, if you want to, you know, make a little more money, you know, just barter with people or whatever you want to do. So it's, that's a choice for you, but it's not, a, um, it's not a requirement. Like, if you're an agorist, you have to trade in black and gray markets, right? Um, and for, for Venuans, it's just an option. You don't have to do it. And if you do do it, it's not going to end the state, but you might be a little better off than you were before. Yeah. Um I'm not sure if black markets are really an option, because if you want to be consistent in your philosophy 
and it kind of depends on what your argument for libertarianism is. If you're a utilitarian libertarian or an economic libertarian, then yes, black markets are an option, uh, and trust an option. Um, but if you're an ethical um, libertarian, then black markets are not really an option. Then uh, your activity on the black markets is an expression of your ethical beliefs. Um, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. All right, very good. So I, I guess people are probably waiting, um, considering uh, we have a second round book on strategy available in paperback copy. When we're we actually going to start talking about that book now that we're uh, over a half hour into the uh, into the interview. So um, yeah, man. Uh, like I said, I, I read it. I reread. I reread it again. We did a 15 episode series on the other podcast I used to do, um, just talk going through um, the various elements of the second realm and going into a lot more details. So. Um, then I re nice. I, then I kind of kicked off Elio Publications and reached out to you and, and asked you if you'd be interested in, or w if you'd be okay with me publishing it. And uh, I, I certainly do appreciate that. I find the book extremely, extremely important. And there's not a whole lot, lot of books out there like it. Um, so I want to make sure uh, that it gets out into the hands of as many as many people as possible. And that's, uh, you know, these second realms can just, uh, you know, be everywhere. Yes. Yes, that would be very nice. Indeed, indeed. So I guess the first question I have for you is, uh, what, what caused you to write that book? Um, I was annoyed. <laughs> um, uh, uh, most of the stuff I ever wrote is um, me being annoyed to explain basic concepts over and over again. So sooner or later, I say, if I write a book about it, then I don't have to talk about it anymore. Yep. And it's clearly a strategy that totally fails, because in the end, you're talking about it much more. But um, the, the reason was um, there was a, a group of, of people, um, like libertarians, anarchists, um, free thinkers, voluntarists, whatever, that were debating a lot. Um, and I was part of that group. And sooner or later, I got fed up with the debating and said, OK, I mean, all this debating and why X is better than then why is it's not working for me? We have to, we have to have a strategy to go from where we are today to where we think we should be. Mm -hmm. And um, that is when I mean, the, the, the contents of the book um, develop over many years, you know, it's, it's uh, hundreds of conversations. And then sooner or later, I said, okay, next time somebody wants to drag me into a conversation, I'm going to put that PDF file into his hands and say, read it first, then we can talk. Yep. Um, so I basically wrote down, it's more like um, a collection of notes. It's not, it's not really fleshed out in every detail um, because of that history, because of uh, it being more like a handout for people that we interacted with um, much more, much more um, closely. So a lot of the the uh, things mentioned in there are not detailed for people that have no idea about the concept, but they're more mentioned as uh, mental anchors. So yeah, okay. that's the history of the book. It's very good. That's kind kind of the yeah kind of the same reason I I mean I've done all the podcasts and and wrote my book. Uh, I wrote my book is yeah basically frustration sick of all the philosophizing sick of all the theorizing um sick yeah. of all the petty debates that i mean about details that don't really matter all that much right um so i decided to so you can really tell with when they matter yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so that's kind of, kind of a yeah similar similar reason for for why i wrote mine um so i i, I guess uh like i said what i've talked about we've talked about the second realm for Oh, at this at probably thirty or forty hours on on the other podcast that I used to do, um, but for for here at the Vani podcast, some of, our, some of my listeners may not be familiar with it. So, could you uh, you know define define what a second realm is? Um, the second realm is everything that not the first realm is, and the first realm is the area of the state. It's the thinking, it's the laws, it's the infrastructure, it's the territory, it's the institutions of the state. And the second realm is not that. It is everything that tries to have um, social and or technical and or for infrastructure and or institution thing that is not the state. 
Um, so that is the, the shortest definition of what second realm is. Um, however, there is a strategy behind how to get there. And the strategy is to combine um, digital crypto anarchy uh, with physical crypto anarchy and specifically also in creating um, physical territory that is embedded within the first realm but in which we were able to experiment, develop and express our own ideas, values, uh, methods, culture. Um, and those are temporary autonomous zones. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. And um, I, I actually did a talk um, uh, on the second realm at was it last year's Midwest Peace Liberty Fest. Yeah, it was. Um, and, you know, it's, it's such a fun talk to give at a freedom festival. Um, because, you know, like halfway, you know, kind of bury the lead halfway through. Has anyone ever been to a, a second realm before? <clears throat> it's like, well, you all are at one right now. Um, at least, exactly. at least, yeah, it's at least how I, how I, um, you know, envision it. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I love the idea. Um, and I mean, it, I, I love how it combines, uh, you know, all sorts of, uh, libertarian idea, uh, you know, historical libertarian ideas, uh, temporary autonomous zones, uh, um, agorism to a certain degree. Um, I'm going to be just black market, what's called black market trading or ethical enclave trading. And um, yep. that's just a, a really, really great idea. So there's actually a related que question here since since you brought up Taz's. Um, R4, oh, go ahead. Uh, continue, please. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, R4V on Twitter. Um, I'm not going to read the whole Twitter handle. Um, but uh, he asks, uh, what is the influence of Taz's on the second realm strategy? And how does it apply to a time of ever-increasing CCTV Big Brother world? Okay. Um, it really depends on what your image of a TAZ is. Um, our image of a TAZ is a little bit more permanent than a festival um, or a conference. So, for example, while we're talking, I am actually located in a TAZ. Um, because we build a TAC. Um, it's a, let's call it a compound in an industrial area that looks like a container storage facility, but um, is in reality a place where people hack and build and meet and trade and whatever. So, um, and it has existed for a couple of years. And it is, it is not permanent in the sense that um, we would never move. We moved once actually with the whole stuff. Um, but for us, TAZ is something that exists long enough that communities can actually flourish there um, on a daily basis. So it's not a thing that you go to once a year, right. but it's a thing that exists all the time. Um, it might change in its existence, it might change in where it is located, it might change in how it exactly looks like, but it is always there in one form or the other. And it's a physical place. Um, so that is our concept or my concept of a TAZ is actually a semi-permanent um, autonomous zone that is embedded within the urban environment. Um, now. Of course, there is CCTV, etc. And the thing, the funny thing is actually, we have a CCTV system ourselves. So we built our own CCTV system that is privacy aware. So when nobody is at the TAZ, it is actually a security system. And as soon as um, any authorized person comes even close to it, it automatically gets switched off. Um, so the the question is, the approach to the TAZ is, of course, something that has to do with CCTV. So we already had stuff like uh, hidden cameras that were set up to to for people to find out who's going to the TAZ. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to have a certain awareness of your surroundings. You have to understand that you have to do counterintelligence and counter surveillance uh, efforts. Um, the, wearing the mask really helps. Um, so. In, in a way, we always have to adapt to the environment in which we are. And you have to be creative in how to exploit the cracks in the surveillance state. 
Indeed, and and you know this this really uh, it brings something to mind. Uh, there's there's one Vanu strategy called Vanuing in cities, and um, and we we've talked about um, even I mean it basically Taz's, but it's uh, more more like a Vanu home base is, is what it is, and most Vanu home bases um, to make to for them to be really as as invulnerable to coercion as humanly possible, they have to be um, temporary and mobile, uh, at least to a certain mm -hmm. extent. So we 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 we'd already talked about. Um, you know the the possibility of like uh, industrial business parks. You could hide a lot of stuff yes. in there. Um, hide a lot of people. Yes. Yep. Um, lot of, lots of entrances and exits. And uh, you could even yes. have uh, kind of uh, you know a front for it too, like a legitimate business. And then maybe yep. not on the bit, not on the uh, building plans, like an underground, uh, um, you know, like underground apartments for you know anarchists or uh, agoras or yep. crypto anarchists or whatever. Um, so like uh, just just trying to explain that. And that's also why the second round book you know rang so like just kind of hit me in the face in a good way. Um, it's like it just it's just kind of combines what we'd already been talking or combine or I guess yeah. elaborate what we what we'd already been talking about. So that was yeah. um, really really awesome. I, I think the the um, how to build a TAZ is actually uh, a thing that needs a lot of thought. So um, when I wrote the second realm, I didn't have a TAZ yet. So um, out of the book came a group of people. Well. In the beginning was two um, who said, "Okay, let's well, let's build a TAZ, but how to do that smart?" And um, we spent a lot of brain power on how do you actually create something like a free space um, that is accessible, that is um, resistance en uh, resistant enough against being taken down, etc. And we have actually settled for a very, very specific technology on, on how to do that. Um, we settled on shipping containers. And the reason for that is this. Um, shipping containers are inherently mobile. So you can ship them around. You know, that's what they're made for. You mm -hmm. know, they're not made for sitting somewhere, but they're made for containing stuff and moving stuff. And they're big enough that you can outfit them with... Um, like office or uh, a bar or uh, a place to live in, you know, like a small apartment. Um, and if you do it right, then nobody from the outside can actually see what's inside. You know, I mean, you, you could look at our containers and they just look like normal containers. Uh, only when you open the doors, can you see, oh, this is, you know, uh, a, a room to sleep with a bathroom, you know, and this is like a hacker space, you know, and this is like a bar. So only, only if you have access already, you can discover what is going on there. And the, the interesting thing with the shipping containers is that they allow you to have mobile capital, which means that when you are um, running into the conflict with the host environment, with the first realm, um, you can undermine the escalation uh, spiral by simply packing your stuff and moving to the next jurisdiction um, or actually just moving to a different property. Because then the whole question of who's running what, what is going on there, etc., 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 the whole process on the of the side on the side of the state has to be restarted. So, and you're not losing capital mm -hmm. um, if you're just relying on um, I always going to stay hidden. Then a single snitch can take out all your capital that they invested. You know, if you if you have like an underground facility. You know, sooner or later, the state will find out about it. And sooner or later, they might actually try to shut it down. And then you're out of all the capital you put into that. And that is how you die. You know, uh, the, yeah. the most st state strategies are um, attrition st uh, strategies. You know, they're not shooting you. They're, they're using attrition in the form of economic attrition. Um, and you have to undermine that concept and the undermination of that is um, being able to keep your capital and restart the escalation spiral. Uh, and that is why we, we settled on shipping containers, because if you're running into, into actual trouble and we want to, to escape, um, we just exploit that the whole transportation system of the whole world is built around shipping containers. Mm -hmm. It's the default mode of, of moving stuff. So with a single phone call, we can have 10 trucks here and a crane um, that moves uh, all of those containers within hours, you know, and then we're gone. Right. Right. Yeah. And 
<clears throat> I'm pretty sure, and like I, my, I'm about ninety five percent sure, but I'll ask because uh, sh- you, you said shipping container and something came, up, came into my mind. Were you on a documentary that's on YouTube um, at some point? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, yeah. so that was you and you were in your shipping containers. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, exactly. So th- th- exactly, that was an, in the the early times of, um, well, not actually early time, but um, that was one of the, the shipping containers. And um, yeah, we moved since then. But, um, and we moved partially because of the movie. But, um, yeah, exactly. So that was that was early stage. Um, since then, we I think we tripled or quadrupled actually the size of of our place. Uh, we did a little a lot more build out and stuff like that. So we um, there's people sleeping here almost every week and stuff like that. So um, yeah, Very it moved cool. along yeah. from there. Yeah, I mean, I, I just randomly popped on a video on YouTube, and I was like, holy shit, that's Smuggler. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> there he is. Wow, okay. Um, so, yeah, very very cool. I, I, I absolutely love it, man. Um, it's, that's, I don't know, that's, that's incredible. And you, guys are, you guys are doing it. Um, and, yeah, you We're guys trying, are, at least. Yeah, yeah. Um, so shipping containers. Okay. Um, and that's a whole, level, a whole hell of a lot cheaper. I mean, Industrial Business Park would be, I mean, would, would be okay, too, I would think. Um, as far as you know, staying staying hidden and all, um, and uh, I guess have, being able to have a front, but that's a lot more expensive than a shipping container. Yeah, the the interesting and you, thing and you, is you would you, have to you, deal with a proxy merchant too. Yeah, but the the thing is that you can combine those things, right? So um, the shipping containers that we have are in an industrial zone. Um, so, but the thing is, we just rent space and rent space through a front company that actually doesn't what's going on and um then we just drop so in in a way the relationship is like a tolerated squatting operation so um the landlord that owns the property doesn't know what's going on and he doesn't have to know Mm -hmm. and um, the intermediary company doesn't do anything else but make sure that the landlord is happy but it's not at all involved what's what's going on you know it's it's just an in-between um and then whenever we have a space like that we can just drop our containers on it um put up our fence and then we're in operation um and the the interesting thing is that nobody gives um, any second thought on a pile of shipping containers in an, an industrial area, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in an industrial zone, you know, I mean, open your eyes and drive around the city and you will see those stacks of, of right. shipping containers everywhere. So plus we're, we're pretending to be uh, a storage facility for sh- shipping containers. So it's very normal that there are shipping containers where we are, right? It's a storage for shipping mm-hmm. containers. Um, but that also means that we can do access control, that it's not unusual that there's, um, you know, alarm systems and CCTV and whatever. Um, and there are people there. And so it's, it's you know, for a casual observer, it's just a normal uh, business that is being conducted, you know. And you actually have to gain access to the place to actually be able to find out, hey, this is not a normal pile of containers. Right, right. Very cool. So, so I guess some, some comes to mind. Um, so, like uh, Amir Taki has been, obviously been in lots of documentaries and such with like their their hacker spaces, their squatting. Um, what what do, you, what do you, I guess I mean, what do you think about uh, what what they do over in uh, in Europe um, as far I guess from a second realm um, security uh, standpoint? Then also just your general thoughts on Amir Taki. I'm curious. Okay, that's that's a really hard question. Um... And I would have preferred you not asking it, but sure. anyways, um, <laughs> so um, I'm uh, a big opponent of actual squatting stuff. Um, you kind of have to respect the property of others if you want your own property to be respected. Sure. So um, if something is actually abundant and you move in, then that can be fine. But I like the 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 interesting thing is what you really should do is exploit the system you know and, and exploit i don't mean be a parasite but use the concept of the system against itself 
So the moment I have a contractual relationship with the landlord, I have certain uh, legal rights that I can pretend that I will use. Um, and that makes escalation and conflict with the state so much easier. The other thing is that as soon as you have a contractual relationship with a, with a landlord um, and you're in good standing with him, you, you pay your bills, you're friendly, you're clean, whatever, you don't cause trouble, then the, the actual interface with the state is that landlord. And that landlord is mostly interested in getting money. He's not interested really in what's going on, which means that as long as your landlord doesn't call the cops, the cops won't show up, you know? So um, you kind of want the landlord to be your friend. And because the, the, the police doesn't just enter private property to enforce something there um, because they have a question or whatever, but they usually come when they're called because they're lazy as shit. And <laughs> you have to exploit that. You have to exploit that. So if your landlord loves you uh, or fears you, then you have a lot of leeway in what you're doing. Um, while as a squatter, you are already in conflict with somebody. You, you kind of created an enemy already. And it's much better to create allies and to even to the point where the ally understands that what you're doing is a little bit shady, but it's not against him. <laughs> and then you, you have interesting psychological things that happen because uh, sooner or later, the landlord asks itself, Hey, have I been aiding and abetting for a while and I better shut up. Otherwise I'm getting into trouble as well. So, um, in a, in a way you can, if you're peaceful and respectful, you can exploit the system and turn it against itself. Very interesting. Very interesting. So um, we, we've, we've talked for, um, you know, after like the five or ten minutes uh, gap, it's probably been close to an hour. So I want to get on to, I want to get on to, to Bitcoin. I got time. I got, you got time. time. Okay. Very good. Very yeah. good. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to, I want to mention with, uh, with, with uh, Second Realms. I, I, I suppose one thing that comes to mind is, and it was uh, when I came across it, because um, it, it's kind of counter to agorism in some respects. Um, but uh, there was a, there's a section in, in Second Realm book that uh, basically, uh, when you're in the first realm, obey the laws. Um, you know, um, not, mm -hmm. obviously don't don't try to alter or change anything. Uh, when you're in the first mm -hmm. realm, uh, you know, do those things. When you're in the second realm, you can be free. Um, so yes. I guess could could you uh, uh, could could you kind of speak to that? Of course. Um... There is there are multiple reasons for that uh, position. Um, there's a str strategic um, reason for that position, and there is an ethical um, position. Um, so let's start with the ethical one. Um, there is this. There's an underlying flaw in human thinking, and the underlying flaw is that when we think we found the truth we have to make everybody else follow the same truth. Um, we're, we're in a way we're programmed to be universalists and totalitarianists. So, and that is true for almost everybody. It's a, it's a very, very common thing. Um, and even if you are thinking that libertarianism, anarchism, whatever is ethically superior, that doesn't give you any right to change the system of people who haven't come to that conclusion yet. So, because in a way, as soon as you go out and change their world and do revolution or whatever, you're doing exactly the same thing that you're complaining about, because what you're really doing is you're exercising uh, power against the will of other people. The state doesn't exist just because there are like five people in government that say, let's have a state. The state exists because the vast majority of people, for one reason or the other, wants the state. And they might be wrong, they might be stupid, they might be unethical, all these things. But none of that gives you the right to tear down their system and their lives. Um, so, in a way, if you want to be uh, coherent person and you want to have a Korean um, 
idea, philosophy about um, liberty, then that really means that you even have to um, respect the stupid and evil decisions of other people as long as they don't affect yourself. So the the whole concept behind Second Realm is to really say, okay, you want to have the state, so go have your state. I don't want it, just leave me alone. You know, and I want to have a place with people that agree with me where we live differently. But we're not going to go into conflict with you. We're not going to tell you how wrong you are or how stupid you are or how evil you are. That's not our business. You might find that out yourself, you know, but um, we're not going to bomb your buildings. We're not going to 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 force the state into its knee. We're not going to destruct the welfare system and so on and so on and so on. Because most people choose that package for reason. And there's no ethical um, justification to destroy their lives and to override their decisions. Um, no, that is the, the ethical aspect. The strategic aspect is um, we often make fun about the state being so stupid. And, you know, as soon as the state gets involved in any, you know, commercial project, it's a guaranteed failure. <laughs> because we, we say, you know, and basically we say this, this, the state is stupid. But there's a, um, a thinking error there. And that is, the state is not in the business of running a business. That is not what a state is. A state is not a corporation. Um, what a state is, is an organization that specializes in the competition of violent actors. And it's the strongest violent actor that comes out of that competition. Um, so the state might be stupid when it comes to economics, but the state is really good when it comes to violence because that is his, his main business. And he has a lot of competition. There are criminal groups, other states, and there is a thousand and thousands of years history of how to uh, excel in being a violent actor. And that is what the state is. So if you think that you can meet such a violent actor in in conflict, like if you if you try to battle against them, you are guaranteed to fail. The, the organizational structure, the systematics of a free market society versus an, an organized cartel of, of, of killers, um, the killers are much better at violence by far. Mm -hmm. um, so what you really have to do is you have to find a way of how to be able to coexist and how to exploit the decision making of that violent actor for your own profit and your own liberty. So what you really have to do is to to use the state against itself so you can carve away pockets of freedom for, for us. And then you number one, you're not in conflict, or at least not in, in, in violent conflict in the sense that you cannot win it. On the other hand, you already also have a moral high ground. Um, if people say, hey, why are you doing that? Why are you not following the laws? Um, then you can always make an argument of, but we're actually making really sure that we're not harming anybody. And we're really making sure to not change anything about your life. And we're actually giving you far more respect than you give us. And that's an argument that works with a lot of people. There are very, very few people that say, but out of principle, you have to, whatever, obey the state and be a slave. Um, when it comes to, to normal individuals, as soon as they see that you're not going to attack their way of life, they will usually say, okay, go ahead, have peace. Right. Right. Very interesting. Very interesting. And something I've, uh, I guess, a little tagline I've used for the second realm is um, we're not, uh, you know, building the new society within the shell of the old. We're building the new society outside of and despite its existence. Um, I don't know. What do you think that's accurate? Um, well, um, <laughs> I'm not sure what inside and outside is, but um, yeah, yeah, in a way, in a way, we are hiding or 
occupying um, space that that the first realm was occupying as well. But um, it's not revolutionary. It's not um, it's not taking down the state. It's not a cancer, and it's not an outside attacker. It's just um, in a way we're, we are building cavities within the system where we can grow our own society. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that, if that metaphor really works for me. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I, I just thought of it and I was like, yeah, might, might get his, get his thoughts on that. But, uh, Hey, now, I, now I, I understand better. So, um, is there anything else, uh, uh regarding second realms you'd like to emphasize or, um, anything you'd like to, uh, um, pass on to the listeners on that subject? Uh, yeah, a few, a few things, because um, it's common questions that come up. Um, so one of the common questions is, um, okay, the second round strategy looks good, but how do I actually start with it? Um, I think the there's a very easy process there. And the process is, number one, you have to find people that live in your same area that you become friends with. Um, you have to have social connections and you have to have a, a group of people that agree on building TAZs because TAZs, digital and physical, are the core of the second realm. Um, without them, you go nowhere. Right. Um, and the second thing is you really have to decide to invest in your locality. Like... Um, a lot of people, you know, they say, okay, I'm going to travel around all my life or um, I'm, I'm going to live in the woods or whatever. But uh, the second realm is really um, a strategy for social people. It's a, it's a strategy for people that cooperate and that together build something. And that requires physical closeness. Um, so it means that you're committing to stay with certain people for a longer time and that you actually become productive together by building a place, um, by, you know, getting the power tools out and getting your bitcoins out and whatever, and actually build a place where you can experience liberty. Um, and that is what's well, so, so real so you're saying that not, so you're saying that we shouldn't just buy Lambos with our bitcoins uh, yeah exactly <laughs> Go ahead, I mean, sorry. just buying Lambos is like yeah I mean please have one if you want but um, don't talk about Liberty if you if you invest all your money in Lambos right so um, <laughs> Yeah, the the thing really is it, it requires commitment of people for people with people to build and to talk much less, you know, just, you know, get your hands dirty, get your backs sweaty and do, you know, like get a power tool, get money, get together with people and then say, okay, let's do this. And then in the process, a lot of things just become clear and you learn so many things. You learn a lot of things about yourself. You learn a lot of things about other people. You learn a lot in how to interact um, between second and first realm. And um, in, in a way, after reading the book, the next step is find friends and build a TAZ. Okay, very good, very good. Um... Yeah, I, I like that. I like that. So um, I suppose let's, let's move on to, uh, I guess, uh, Bitcoin questions here and you know discussions on sure. cryptocurrency. Um, so there's a question from someone on Twitter uh, regarding uh, Bitcoin. And uh, he asks, uh, um, give us a critical review of Bitcoin from a crypto anarchy point of view. What are its pros and cons and what can be improved? At the risk of not offending anyone, please don't hold back. So he's telling you to go all out. <laughs> um. I won't hang up, I promise. Go ahead. Okay. Um, um, number one, I like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies for one reason. And that is that they have enabled a lot of people to do um, relatively fast, relatively quick, and permissionless financial transactions. That's a really big thing. You know, um, if you ever started a business and um, 
and found out banking regulation, taxation, whatever, then you know what the value of cryptocurrencies is. Um, in, a, in a way, cryptocurrencies have given to a lot of people what the Swiss bank account has been when I was young. Mm -hmm. um, so, and with far less costs and far less complexity and um, it, it really opened up a space for people to just start a commercial operation um, without a lot of overhead. So that is superb about cryptocurrencies. Um, in a way, that has existed before um, with digital gold currencies, etc. But they um, failed because of governance is risks, um, because there's the problematic issue of a government being around and shutting down your operation. And um, doing that for cryptocurrencies is simply harder. It's far harder to shut down cryptocurrencies than it is to shut down a regular bank that is just not sticking to the rules. Um, so that is the great part about cryptocurrencies. Um, there are issues with cryptocurrencies as well. Um, I have three issues with cryptocurrencies. Um, one of the issues that is really problematic is most of our activity <clears throat> is, um, is crossing currency border borders. So you're buying stuff in US dollars and you're selling them for Bitcoin or vice versa. And that means that exchange rate risks are a real hindrance for business. Um, that is something to be, to be really, really aware of, is that if you're running a real profit-oriented business with cryptocurrencies, um, that is extremely hard. You're, unless you're, you're um, operating a service-only thing um, where you don't have expenses, then um, cryptocurrencies are, from a business side of, of, of the whole thing, are a real problem. You still there? Yes, yes, I'm just listening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's number one. Um, number two is that uh, cryptocurrencies um, are not as invulnerable to coercion than many people think. Um, some people treat cryptocurrencies as if they are holy and outside of anything that could happen to them. And I think that is extremely naive. Um, so what we already see is, you know, KYC becoming much more important for exchanges. Um, in a way, the, the whole OTC exchange market or a big chunk of the OTC exchange market has been regulated out of existence. Um, now you have to go to um, a registered and regulated um, exchange. They are using KYC and AML. So essentially what you're back into is a bank account. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in a way, without really attacking the cryptocurrencies themselves, um, what the state has, has um, managed to do, and it was highly predictable that they would do that, is they regulated the ecosystem to kill the main aspects of why cryptocurrencies make sense. Um, and the third thing is, um, especially when it comes to Bitcoin and a few other cryptocurrencies with some exceptions, is they are a perfect record for getting you into jail. Um, because of chain analysis, etc. So um, there has never been a time or a system actually that was so transparent to everybody as uh, cryptocurrencies. Like if you, if you ever looked into the details of the banking system, it's so much more harder to trace a transaction through the banking system than it is um, to trace a transaction between two Bitcoin exchangers um, or um, a Bitcoin exchanger or a client in a shop or whatever. So because of the blockchain and um, the blockchain is quote unquote forever. Um, you, it's, it, it doesn't have any ambiguities. It doesn't have any errors that you can point to and say, hey, this was just an error. It is, in a way, it is a perfect record of truth. 
And the only thing that a state has to do is to be able to connect the addresses to each other. And then you have no excuse anymore. And having a record of all transactions publicly forever is like one of the most stupid ideas I've ever heard of. <laughs> fair, yeah, fair points. Fair points, for sure. Um, so, so I guess uh, a follow-up question to that, uh, just from me, would, uh, would be that... Um, now, do you think uh, wallets like Samurai and Wasabi, you know, privacy-focused wallets... Um, and also the Lightning Network, do you think those improve the situation at all? Do you think that makes Bitcoin viable from a second realm of crypto anarchist perspective? Uh, uh, could you speak to that? Um, well, when it comes to privacy of our wallets, I'm a big fan. You know, I mean, Samurai, I, I mean, the, the people alone are pretty cool. And the work is pretty interesting. So, um, yes, you have to kind of use a privacy of our wallet to make Bitcoin usable at all in my opinion um when it comes to lightning etc um i actually think there's an um i don't think that the the privacy promises of lightning are actually that good so i'm actually not that sure on on if that is enough um, sure, and I, and I think, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but just for the benefit of the listeners, uh, the, the argument goes that since not every transaction is settled on the blockchain, it provides more privacy, since, it's not, um, since every single transaction isn't on there. And you could have just uh, you know 25 transactions between people, and then one person ends up settling on the, settling on the blockchain at the end of the day. Um, so that's, right. that's, that's kind of the argument. So you don't think that uh, really holds much weight? Well, it, it holds much weight compared to the current situation, which is shit. You know, the current situation of everything is on the blockchain is shit. But if you compare it to other systems, even when you compare it to the banking system, um, I mean, in, in a way, what, what Lightning does, it, it moves a little bit farther, further towards how banking works um, to get a little bit more of obscurity. Um, so, in a, in a way... Um, it is ironic. It is. It is really ironic if you if you if you think about it, because what we were actually doing here is, um, Bitcoin was created basically as something like um, uh, how you say it, a, algorithmic uh, federal reserve, and then on top of the federal reserve system, you build the Lightning Network, which is basically the commercial banks. Um, the only thing that is missing, of course, is the the regulation and licensing of those entities you know um yes in the bitcoin space we're not having the issue of regulation and licensing for lightning nodes yet but from a systematic perspective it is exactly what we're doing we're copying the banking system um with just one real difference and that is um when it comes to to um uh, money creation uh, the money creation is algorithmic instead of uh, political, um, but from a from a systematic uh, point of view, uh, yes, what we're doing is we're building the the early days of the Federal Reserve System um, with layers of of intermediaries, um, and those intermediaries right now there are a lot of them. Um, because everybody just, you know, can start a lightning node, and that is great. Um, however, when it comes to, you know, network effects, etc., it is relatively predictable that um, the number of highly connected and highly capitalized lightning nodes is going to be very small. And those are essentially becoming hubs in, in the lightning network. Uh, they are basically banks. Um, and it's just a matter of time before um, the government will say, hey, you look like a bank. Maybe you need the same regulation as a bank. Mm -hmm. And then what? So, yeah, what's, um, what's in, next? Yeah, exactly. So in, in, in my opinion, there, there, is, there are things that cryptocurrencies solve, like actually solve. And that is um, they are a distributed virtual currency 
which means primarily that the the currency function like creating money function is um is depoliticized and harder to 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 regulate by the state than normal banks would be you know i mean there have been banks issuing their own currency forever um i mean it's still today it's a it's a relatively normal thing that some banks issue their own currency um now doing it distributed and doing it algorithmically is an improvement for some people um i'm not 100 percent sure that doing it algorithmically is actually better than doing it politically but that's a different thing um but it's distributed and that's a good thing uh it's harder to take down but it is not something that massively increases privacy and it's not something that massively improves the attribution issue um, that is true for other cryptocurrencies. I mean, if you look at Zcash, if you look at Monero, if you look at Mimblewimble based systems, um, they are much closer to the crypto anarchistic idea of how, how money should work. Um, I'm not sure if blockchain systems are really the end of all. I'm, I'm kind of betting that there's a better way to do it, but we haven't found it yet. But, um, yeah, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. It's the, the Bitcoin is the the Federal Reserve of the cryptocurrency space, um, and it is Grin and Monero and Zcash that are the uh, black market trader currencies of choice. Interesting, interesting. So, um, I guess speaking to the to the maximalist position here, what what do you think about? Um, I mean, kind of the the the, the claim there is that. Um, eventually, Bitcoin will become, uh, you know, like the Bitcoin standard, kind of like the, you know, the gold standard. Bitcoin will be the um, the, the medium of exchange worldwide, um, and since governments can't control it, um, then it will wars, it will end taxation, it will end all of these things. You don't think that's a, uh, a good no, 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 I'm sorry that I'm laughing, but um, from a from a technical perspective, Bitcoin can I mean Bitcoin can't even compete with Visa in in the US, let alone with all the payments that are done in cash and all the payments done worldwide. I mean the the amount of payments that are happening every day is staggering, you know? Um you know you don't replace that easily with uh, a blockchain based system. Um even with lightning, I mean, the only thing you, you, you really gain when you put lightning on top of that is, yeah, then you have enormously big hubs that connect enormously many people. Um, and then you, you do your transactions through that. I mean, that is ludicrous. I mean, what exactly have we won there? So, um, no, I, from a, from a technical point of view, that alone is, is, um, I, I, I find that humorous, uh, beyond end. Um, when it comes to the claim government cannot regulate it, um, I'm really sorry, but what co government can and cannot do is only limited by human imagination. And I would really go out and ask a few, you know, computer security people, a few scenario thinkers, and etc., uh, and ask them how would you actually take down. Bitcoin, whatever. And then they would point to places like China or Russia and say, you know what? Um, yeah, you, you, you can, you know, control large parts of the internet if you really want to. And, um, you could kill a lot of communication on the internet. And because Bitcoin, uh, is, is internet based, you can make Bitcoin extremely hard to use. It might not kill it, but it will certainly be, hindered enough that it's not going to be the currency of choice for people because people really want to do transactions and that is another thing when when you look at that cryptocurrencies how much of the money flowing there is actually transactions paying for people paying for goods and services and that is uh i mean it's minute you know it's there's almost nothing happening there because everybody's just speculating um so I'm I'm slightly critical when it comes to that. 
was slightly critical. Um, I, I understand why one could wish for that for political reasons. I certainly would wish for it um, because then I would be filthy rich because my Bitcoins would probably go up by a factor of 5,000 mm -hmm. um, if that would, would be happening. Yeah, of course, you know, um, but in in a way, it's it's a fairy tale. I don't believe in that at all. I don't. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. I, I, I certainly appreciate um, the explanation there. Now, I, I want to bring up, and I guess we're on the, the cryptocurrency portion of this here. So, um, in hashtag Agora, um, there's something uh, called open transactions. And yes. um, I, I even brought this up to uh, um, one, of, uh, one of the developers for a project I'm working on. Um, he's, he's a Bitcoin maximal, so I showed him open transactions. He's, or I, I mentioned open transactions. He said, oh, yeah, that's, that's, you know, I, I, it's great. I'm sad it didn't go anywhere. Or I'm sad it's not, you know, like, I guess, uh, around. So um, I guess I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, could you provide a, uh, if, if, you're, if you're familiar with it, could you provide like an overview of what, what's, uh, and I guess this was a solution um, that, or I guess a lot of uh, crypto anarchists saw the problem with Bitcoin early on and tried to come up with a different solution. So could you explain a little bit about open transactions? <clears throat> Oh, well, uh, one of the things to, to make clear there is um, Bitcoin is by far not the first digital currency. Um, crypto anarchists have dealt with uh, digital currencies, digital payments long before Bitcoin, like long before. We, I mean, the, the first papers on the whole stuff are from the 80s. The first implementations are from the mid 90s. Um, I think even open transactions is older than Bitcoin. If I remember correctly, um, we had stuff like eCash, we had stuff like eCash, uh, we had stuff like uh, Yodel. We, I mean, there there has been a huge history on um, how to do digital transactions, and there have been experiments that have been really big, like uh, multi million of multi billion dollar experiments. Um, so. Bitcoin is not the first. Bitcoin is the first of a kind. Um, so that's number one. So the the next thing is, open transactions is really a collection of framework of of what you could do in in that realm. Um, it has two interesting, well, three in interesting aspects. Uh, number one is it is um, a verifiable account system. So it allows you to run a bank that cannot betray its clients. So that is number one. So you can always prove to the bank that um, your account status is a certain one. And you can prove that to everybody else. So in a way, it prevents the bank to do from defrauding you. Um, it cannot steal money from your account. It cannot make a transaction without um, asking your permission and so on and so on. So that is one part of open transactions. The other part of, of open transactions that is interesting is that it employs a framework for something that's called a digital bearer certificate, which is uh, one of the earliest ideas on how to do internet banking or internet transactions actually. It's an uh, extremely efficient way of transferring value. Um, and it actually has the potential to be actually completely untraceable and anonymous. Mm. So you can build uh, digital birth certificate systems that are provably anonymous. They are better than cash. Like from the privacy um, perspective, they're better than physical cash. Um, and nobody can collude against you to break that uh, anonymity. Um, contrary to, to a lot of things that we have in the current cryptocurrency space, if enough people conspire against you, they can undermine your, your anonymity. While in DBC systems, you can build systems where you can always be in the plus one situation, which means that it is always indistinguishable if it was you or a specific other person. Um, so the, the security properties of DBC systems are much better. They're also much cheaper and they're much faster. They have one issue though. They are vulnerable to issue risk. And that is what, what Bitcoin fundamentally changed 
is it created a system where the issue of risk is distributed. It's not going away, but it's distributed over many parties that are incentivized to to act honestly um, within the definition of a protocol. Um, and DBC systems have the issue that the issuer could theoretically create a scenario when he can uh, defraud you. Hmm. And that is an at least publicly an unsolved issue. Um, and what happened, in my opinion, when, when Bitcoin came up, is that a certain political narrative won. And the political narrative is uh, the thing we have to solve with the issue risk, hence let's have a distributed system, instead of saying our main issue is financial privacy. Let's have a DBC system. Ah, uh, Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I, I will be honest. Uh, up until I guess maybe like the middle of last year, I, I, I kind of uh, you know I appreciated Bitcoin. Um, I appreciated it, but I like I like I like Monero a lot more because that's something I saw that Bitcoin was was severely lacking mm -hmm. was privacy. Um, so, exactly. I mean, yeah. So I, 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 I yeah, I, I certainly understand that. Um, so I guess um, there was. Uh, I guess I'll ask, this, I'll, I'll ask the couple questions simultaneously so um with your with your background in uh you know computer security and uh crypto anarchism um what's your overall viewpoint on on the uh, cryptocurrency space now like uh, icos uh smart contracts everyone trying to build some new tool on the blockchain um i mean what, what, what do you think about that is it uh, uh, gonna be at some point is it, is it just is it a good is it uh, you know a good thing you know we'll get some good ideas out of these out of these uh, projects or um what, what, what do you think um, well, in a, in a way, it's um, the beauty and the brutality of the market that's happening. And that is, um, there's an idea that convinces people, and nobody really knows how to, to how to deal with it and what to do with it. So what do we do? We do a lot of trials. And a lot of those ideas will um, dramatically fail. But... On the other hand, we will also be lucky and find a few things that really make sense. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a it's a normal thing, you know. If you if you're dealing with a new technology or a new idea that you don't fully understand because you cannot fully understand it, or because you cannot really predict how the environment will react to it, then what the market does it it tries it out. And yes, a lot of people fail and lose all their money, whatever. But in the Everybody learns. So that is what, what is happening right now. Um, of course, it's you know combined with a lot of hype, and we gonna solve everything from you know hunger to world peace and and healing cancer and everything. But um, a lot of that is is just marketing talk. Um, so far, the true applications of of blockchain technologies outside of currency like algorithmic currency, escape me. I have to admit that. Um, there are not that many things except for algorithmic currencies and maybe title management that really makes sense on the blockchain. Uh, for everything else, we already have solutions that are pretty good um, and far better understood and faster and cheaper and uh, more stable and so on and so on. So there's a lot of... Um, people that make money by using a term that nobody understands sure. um, and a lot of people not having much clue about how to build distributed systems um, when it comes to smart contracts there I'm a I'm a total heretic um, I, was have I, I remember you mentioning in the presentation it was like I think you just kind of mentioned in passing I hate smart contracts or something like some, something like that so I was going to have you yeah. What, yeah. Yeah. Go, go ahead yeah I'm curious. <laughs> okay, it's, it's it's not a technical argument that I have there. Um, from uh, a technical point of view, theoretically, you can have good uh, smart contracts. Um, I mean, we have to learn how to make them actually good. We don't know that yet. We don't really know how to deal with um, the security of unchangeable, forever committed code. Um, I mean... Basically, uh, your Windows operating system gets an update every day, but we have the idea that we can create contracts that 
run huge organizations forever and commit them on their mm. blockchain. You know, that's kind of, there's a little bit of a hoopers there. Um, like the idea that some people think that they can write perfect code. I haven't seen much perfect code in my life. Um, Have you ever? Like none. <laughs> No. Uh, yeah, well, I, I would like to say I, I never saw it, but uh, in recent years, when it comes to formal proofs and and symbolic uh, testing of, of software, we have created software that, at least within specification, does exactly what it should do. And the problem just gets pushed upwards. It's towards the specification. Mm. Um, but the implementation itself, yes, we can make almost perfect implementations. Um, but I think we're still not in the, we're not able to do perfect specifications yet. So it's, it's, yes, there is perfect code if you define it correctly. Um, but my, my problem with smart contracts is actually not technical. It's philosophical. Um, what smart contracts do is they make the assumption that an agreement between people, um, is static over time. Like if you make a contract between two business partners, um, then there's this assumption behind smart contracts that this relationship always is completely and unchangeably defined in the contract. Mm -hmm. But that is not true because um, no contract in the real world works like that. A contract is more like a, a meeting of minds. You know, it's like a, it's like a guidepost and the contract is never fully complete. It doesn't handle every single case. And it's also not static. The interpretation of a contract, how you value certain clauses, how you weigh certain clauses, is a thing that is open to the interpretation of, of all involved parties and the judicial system or arbitration uh, or, or anything like that. So in a way, a contract in the real world is a dynamic system while a smart contract is a static system. Um, and I think there, there would be better ideas on how to um, transfer dynamic contracts into computers. And I don't think those are um, blockchain executed smart contracts. I, I, I think it's much more interesting to have like um, algorithmic voting systems that's far more useful when it comes to, to actually running real world business. Right. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. I have not heard and it makes sense, but I haven't thought of that. And I really haven't heard many people raise that claim. So or raise that counter argument. So, uh, uh, I definitely, definitely do appreciate that. Um, so yeah, we're coming up in about an hour and a half and, um, I, I don't have, I really don't have, uh, much else to cover here. Um, basically gone through, uh, gone through it all. So I guess I'll, I'll just, uh, kind of leave it open ended for you. Uh, do you have any, uh, closing thoughts for the listeners on crypto anarchism, second realms, uh, the cryptocurrency space, um, or, uh, uh, anything like that? Yes, I do. And I think that, um, uh, there are two things that, um, I would like to emphasize, emphasize. Um, thing number one is, um, we really have to be careful with all the things that we do to not by accident create a new monster. Um, because of this universal list perspective, because of our inbred totalitarianism, even with the best intentions, you can create systems that you don't understand and that become evil. Mm -hmm. Even if you think that you have the perfect ethics, and even if you think that you have the perfect argument, um, all of that, if you cannot respect that other people have a different opinion, and you cannot respect that they explore a different thing, and that you cannot respect that they might be voluntarily binding themselves into a system that you find unacceptable, um, then you are on the path to creating a dystopia because a dystopia is an utopia gone wrong. Um, it started with the best of intentions, but it wasn't flexible enough and it was too total. So, um, that is a thing that I have learned in, in the last years is to be much less 
demanding of people, much less um, convinced of myself, um, and much more inclined to listen to people who have a very different view than my uh, than myself and i think that is something that that really needs to be kept in mind so um and you can see that in the cryptocurrency space i mean a lot of the communication there is simply toxic and mm -hmm. that is not a good sign you know i mean if you're a grown-up adult then um if somebody is a jerk you ignore him you don't start uh, a multi-year twitter war you know, <laughs> um, so that is, you know, in a, in a way, even if they're all wrong and you are right, then that you are right will be proven by your success, not by a hundred million tweets. Um, success is, is what, what values it, uh, what, what matters it. Um, so that is one thing. And the other thing is, I think we have to, to really be, um, careful to keep in mind that technology, communication, etc., today um, are creating a world that might be too inflexible, that might be too unique, that might be too much of the same color, that might work by too few rules, um, that might have too little diversity, too too few ideas that are tried out, um, and with technological amplification, this is a really dangerous scenario. Um, if we all follow the same rules, then we become uh, vulnerable to to the same um, catastrophes. Um, everything becomes harmful to everybody. We are creating monocultures. We do that in technology, we do that in politics, and so on and so on. And because of technological amplification and because of globalization, monocultures become a civilization risk. Um, the reason why crypto anarchy is important is not because everything and everybody has to be, has to be a crypto anarchist, but because the ideas behind crypto anarchism create a space of experimentation and a space of alternative and they are an opportunity to to inject something into the world that keeps the world from becoming a monoculture and that if you really think about it might actually be necessary for our long-term um survival when it comes to thinking when it comes to idea generation when it comes to technological advancements or maybe even to survival. So that is why crypto anarchy is important. Awesome. That was a, a, an incredible, uh, incredible way to, to, to close out this interview. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you so much for your time, Smuggler. Uh, it was a pleasure chatting with you, and uh, I, I sure hope we can do it again. Um, is there uh, sure. any uh, websites or uh, anything you want to plug uh, before I let you go? Um, well, anaplex.net, of course, and uh, opaque link. Um, those are the two websites I publish on. Um, yeah, that's kind of it. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Well, yeah, th thanks a lot, man. I, I, I really, really, really do appreciate it. It was a great conversation, and I mean, um, I mean, I, 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 I've been consuming this material for for a couple of years now, um, a year and a half, two years now, and uh, it was great to actually to to speak with you and have you elaborate on some things and uh, also get a little more insight uh, uh, into. Um, just um, crypto anarchism in general, and also the uh, the cryptocurrency space, because that's uh, pretty insane. And uh, someone with your background, it's, uh, it's definitely valuable for me and my listeners. So I do appreciate it. You're so welcome. It was a pleasure. Very good. And uh, obviously, you can get Smuggler and XYZ's book, Second Realm Book on Strategy, by visiting libertyunderattack.com, uh, or you can purchase on Amazon. Um, so yeah, thanks for tuning in. Uh, many more podcasts on the way. Uh, so make sure to subscribe on Fascist Tube and on your favorite podcatcher. Until next time, let's build the Agora and let's build second reps.